Well, good morning. Your life ever feel that way? You're pursuing something, you're trying to get it done, and it just seems like one thing after the other, after the other, after the other. So today we're going to talk about this idea of testing and perseverance. We're starting a series on the book of James. I probably do a series on James about every three years. I love the book of James. Very practical. Uh, so many practical things in the book of James. And I think what we're going to talk about today with this idea of persevering um, I really think if, if you don't need this sermon, somebody you know does. So uh, here's a question. Um, you ever feel like you need wisdom? Anybody in here feel like they need wisdom? Anybody know someone who needs some wisdom? Anybody? How many of you would like to share your... No, I just... Okay. So, you know, can I, can I just give you this? If you miss everything else today, let me tell you this one thing. And if you can hang on to this, it may really help you. Sometimes. I believe the most spiritual thing you can do is just persevere. When you don't feel like it, when you're dealing with difficult things, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is just, if you know God wants you to do it, if you know you're supposed to just do just just persevere. Just, just keep going. And uh, even if the elephant comes, uh, you know, <laughs> just, just keep going. So um, I have felt dumb many times in my life. We're going to talk about these three things today. We're going to talk about perseverance. We're going to talk about how we're prideful. And then we're going to talk about the promise. So perseverance, pride, and promise. And I don't know about you, but I've had many times in life that I've felt really dumb. If you've been here at church very often, people tell me all the time, you're such a great non-example to us. I feel very good about my faith when I hear you talk about life. And um, this is going to be a cautionary tale for Randy so, Randy, I'm just telling this story for you. Everybody else just gets to listen. So, years ago when Kyle was little, Kyle was such a great big brother to Lydia. And uh, um, so, it was Dad's Day with the kids. And so, Dad's Day with the kids means that I want to do as little work as possible. So, I grab the kids. Uh, Lydia's a little, little thing in diapers. She's wandering around. It's awesome. Kyle's the you know, five-year-old giant big brother who keeps an eye on his sister, so that gives dad a little freedom. And we went to the McDonald's play place. And as we got to the McDonald's play place, I went and ordered food, and I came back, and Kyle said, I'll, I'll take Lydia, and we'll go play. And I looked at Lydia's diaper, and I noticed it was a touch wet, but I thought, it'll be fine. Randy, did you hear what I just said? It will be fine. That's not good enough. Just know that from my example. With a new baby, it'll be fine is not fine. So we're sitting there. I got my Big Mac. I have dumped my fries in the Big Mac box, as all professional McDonald's eaters do. You can't eat them out of the box. They've got to go in the other half of the Big Mac box. I'm so glad they haven't gone to wrappers because that would just ruin my technique. And so... I'm just getting ready to bite into the Big Mac, and Kyle comes running to my table. And he says these words, Dad, Lydia's diaper has exploded. Now, my mom questioned me about this, so I just want you to know, it was only wet. So it's not as gross of a story as it may sound. Although, when I looked up, Lydia was at the top of that little tunnel that you climb through to get to the top to go down the slide. She was right at the top and, and there were children below her and there was snow, diaper snow raining down on little children's heads below her. I didn't know there was a microphone available at the McDonald's but apparently there was because suddenly there was an announcement, please clear out the play place. I felt like there was a nuclear disaster. So, of course, Lydia came to me. I grabbed Lydia. I grabbed Kyle. Kyle grabbed the food. We're smart. We headed to the car, ducking from glances and stares and evil looks. As we got to the car, I'll never forget this. I, I put Lydia in the car. I changed her diaper and put, it, put her in the, in the uh, uh, kid's seat back there and buckled her in, and I looked up, and there was a dad heading in with his two kids, and I, this is what I said to him. I'll never forget this. I looked at him, and I said, hey, um, they had to close the play place. Some guy let his kid's diaper explode, and I got in the car and left, and I thought, I'm glad. 
I'm out of here. I thought I'd save at least one person. Now, I don't know if parents went home and had to disinfect their children with bleach. I, I, I know that that play place was shut the rest of the day because I tried to go back. And uh, uh, I felt like an absolute idiot. And I don't know if you've had those idiot moments. I had an idiot moment in the hospital. And I, you know, I consider myself a professional remote control user. Uh, I, I know we've got some guys. Yep, yep Carl, I knew you'd be one. And uh, uh, some of us are so good, we, can, we don't even have to look at the remote. We know what's going to happen. We can, we, can me- we can go from football game to baseball to football to all of a sudden axe throwing is on TV. Why is axe? Well, but I'm watching it. I'm watching it. Axe throwing. Why would they put axe throwing on? That's pretty interesting. The axe throwing is pretty. Did you know they're now playing uh, uh, cornhole on TV? They have cornhole. And, and, and you think, who watches this? Yeah, that's me. That's me because a commercial comes on and I'm watching everything else, everything. There's, so I'm a professional at remotes. Well, I thought I was until I got to the hospital. And at the hospital, uh, uh, they had the, the button to turn on the lamp, overhead lamp. So when I would go to get up, I'd push the button. And this happened three times. I pushed the button and all of a sudden a red light comes on. And I hear, yes, may we help you? Oh, I'm so sorry. I was trying to turn the light on. I just... And by the way, at this hospital, I found out later, the nurses have two minutes to get to your room and turn off the bank. They can't turn it off at the desk. They actually have to come to your room. I wish I had known how to turn it off because I did this three times in the middle of the night. Three times, nurses came to my room and I went, hey, I'm an idiot. I'm dumb. I don't know how to push buttons. I'm an idiot. It, that's not my fault they put the lamp button right next to the nurse call button. It's not my fault, but, but I felt like a doofus. And I don't know if you've had those moments in life that you felt like you didn't know what was going on and you couldn't get something right or you thought things were going to go well and they didn't go well. James in James chapter 1, the brother of Jesus is talking to the early church, mostly a Jewish church, but non-Jews were joining the church. He was the head of the church in Jerusalem and he writes this letter, but the letter is not just to Jerusalem. It's called a circular letter. And a circular letter meant that it went through the churches. The, most of the New Testament letters that we have from Paul were, were written for a specific church, but they weren't just written for that church. They were written for us to read. So guess what? We, we still read them. And so James was that way. And James is the brother of Jesus. Imagine being the brother of Jesus as a child. I mean, you remember Jesus' first miracle, right? Mary finds out, oh, there's no wine. And she says, go talk to Jesus. You know what that tells me? That one day Jesus was at the house and Mary said, man, I wish we had something else to drink for dinner. And Jesus just went poof and water to wine. And he, huh? can you imagine being James sitting at that table? Uh, why can't you be more like your brother? I mean, imagine, why can't you be more like Jesus? You're like, oh, it's Jesus. And here's what's awesome, though. At one point, Jesus is teaching people. It says in the Bible that his family shows up. By the way, some people believe that Mary did not have other children, which you've really got to throw out like a bunch of New Testament scriptures to think that. I'm just saying. So you've got to really do some gymnastics to think that somehow Jesus had brothers, but they weren't Mary's. And this is confusing. Anyway, so, so and of course, he's his half-brother. We know that, that um, the Holy Spirit it wasn't Joseph, so we've got Mary, but... James and his, his rest of his family, his brothers, come and they try to get Jesus because they think he's crazy. So they're coming to take him away, ha ha, ho ho, he he, to the flame farm. I mean, this is James who's going to write this book. And James finally comes to the point after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, that he realizes, oh, I probably should have noticed a couple things as a kid. Even though I thought he was crazy for a little while, I probably... And he's looking back, and he's looking back through the life of Jesus. I'm sure he's remembering the time that Mary's like, hey, could we have some wine for dinner again? Maybe, maybe Jesus, like, you know, one of his pets died, and he raised it from the dead. I don't know. You know, what could have happened as a kid? But even with all that, James said, you're crazy to think you're the son of God. And then one day, James said, wait a second. He is the son of God. And so James is talking to the early church as one who was a non-believer, not only a non-believer, but a skeptic and even a critic. And now he says, I know where real wisdom comes from. And so you've got the early church being persecuted, the early church dealing with struggles. And so I'm going to give you three things from James chapter 1 today that hopefully 
you can hang on to, and it will help you recognize that perseverance and then pride, and then we'll talk about the promise. Here we go. Number one, perseverance. Perseverance. I remember one of the things I said earlier was one of the most spiritual things you can do sometimes is just keep going. Just keep going. When you don't feel like it, when you don't feel like doing what's right, just do what's right. Just do what's right. I don't feel like it. We'll do what's right anyway. So consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, I'm going to come back to this idea of trial, so just hang on to that. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And I don't know anybody who likes perseverance. I don't know anybody's like... You know, every once in a while, one of your friends will post, I had a great workout this morning. And all you can think is, I don't care. Right? Right? And, and I know they post it because they want to be accountable. But what I want to write is, I, I never have a good workout. I, every workout is awful and terrible. The best part of the workout is when it's over. Right? And that's what perseverance is. It's just, I'm making it through. Right? Uh, uh, making it through the world today takes everything you got. Um, wouldn't you like to get away where everybody knows your name? A little cheers reference for those of you who had no idea what that was about. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And then listen to this. Let perseverance finish its work. Why? So you may be mature and complete. Do you think you're fully mature yet? I know, I know people who are older who are less mature than people who are younger, don't you? People who have no patience. People who are, are irritable and aggravated all, right, Carl? Aggravated all the time, right? right? So what, is, what does maturity do? Maturity helps you to, to deal with things in life. And so he says, let it finish its work so you can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And then listen to this. If you don't hear anything else today, listen to this next sentence. If any of you lacks wisdom, let me just show of hands. Anybody in here lacking wisdom in an area? Well, oh, yeah, okay. If any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask, and this word ask means keep asking. It doesn't just mean ask. And by the way, people ask me all the time about this. They're like, doesn't it say sometimes in the Bible just to pray and trust? It does. And it also says to knock and keep knocking. And so it's both. It's both to trust God and to say, God, this is, I really need wisdom. By the way, if you have children and you haven't prayed for wisdom, you are way behind. Right? If you work in a cubicle next to somebody who makes a lot of noise all the time, you need wisdom. Lord, help me to know what to do or how to deal with this, right? It's, it's simple things. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask, keep asking God, why? Who gives generously to all, and I love this, without finding fault. Like, you know, when you push the wrong button or when the diaper explodes, you think, I'm so dumb that I feel dumb asking God for wisdom because God's like, duh. But it says he gives it to you without finding fault. And then it continues. And it will be given you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Why? Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That is that deadliest catch moment. Right? You're just being thrown all over the place. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now, this word here for trials, this word here uh, for going through difficulty... It's a word that's used for crucible. Now, we don't use the word crucible for anything. But let me tell you what it is and what it was. Now, if you've ever watched this How It's Made show, you've seen them make huge vats of steel. they got these big containers, and they, it's glowing, and they throw, you know, they're able to purify the steel. But it used to be that when they were purifying gold or silver or something else, they actually used like something that was like a cup. And it was called a crucible. And what the crucible would do is you would heat up, whether it was gold or silver or some other precious metal, it would heat it up, and then the junk would go to the top, and they'd scrape the junk off. Why? To purify what was in there. See, I've got a very small crucible right here. Anytime you make tea, anytime you make coffee, you're, you're doing just a slight crucible. And I hope when you make your coffee tomorrow, you'll think of this. Because let me tell you when you have a tea bag, what comes out when you put it in the hot water whatever's in the bag. And the truth for some of us is the only way you know what's inside of you is when you go through a hard time. Everybody's nice when life is perfect. Everybody's nice when the flowers are blooming and the birds are singing and, you know, la, 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 right? Everybody's happy then. It's when life is tough and we have a reaction and stuff comes up that we think, I've never said that before. 
what's happening, the crucible. We get to discover what's really going on, and then we have to say, God, I need your help. You know, I think of perseverance, people working on this Artemis mission. We have Amy Sue back here, one of our wonderful lady engineers at the Space Center. So proud of you. And, you know, been working on this thing forever, trying to get it. And, and listen, I can tell you that over and over, there were days that engineers were banging their heads on tables out there. When they were trying to figure out, hey, hey, this is stuff we used to use. Why don't we know how to use this anymore? And they had to, by the way, they had to hire some of the old guys from the Apollo missions to come and tell them how to work it the old stuff that they're using again. Can you imagine everybody that had to persevere for that thing to be on the launch pad? And I hope it launches tomorrow. The only people that, aren't, that are happy if it doesn't launch is Denny's in Titusville. That place loves it. When that doesn't launch, they just fill that place up forever, right? But what happens? Perseverance. You've got you to keep going. And there's times in life that you just want to quit, but you've got to keep going. And especially when you know what's right and you know what's wrong, there are times in life that you have to say, I don't feel like doing that, but I know it's what's right. I don't feel like going forward, but I know what's right. Listen to what it says here in Romans. Not only so, we glory in our sufferings. Paul is crazy. We glory in our sufferings. Basically, we say, I know I need that. Because we know suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame. Why? Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. And what is he saying? He's saying when the crucible comes, because God has poured his love into my heart, <laughs> instead of hate and anger and frustration, we should begin to notice as the Holy Spirit's working in our life, I'm more loving when I go through things than I used to be. Wouldn't it be nice if you were as nice to people as you are to animals? Isn't it amazing we could be mean to people and then see our dog go, Oh, you cute little baby. we got a lot to learn. And so what do we need to do? We need God to pour his love into our heart. Why? So that when the heat comes, when the fire comes, when the crucible comes, so that love is what comes out and not impatience and irritation and aggravation and frustration and all the Asians that go with that. I choose to trust God in the trial. When's the last time you've said that? God, I'm going to choose to trust you. One of my favorite prayers is, God, I don't understand you, but I trust you. I don't understand why this is happening, but I trust you. Number two, pride. Pride. So I've been in the hospital three times in the last month and a half. That's so much fun. Can I tell you after the second time I did not want to go back? After the first time I didn't want to go back. So after the second time I come home, the night I came home, I started running 102, 103 degree fever. I'd wake up in the middle of the night covered in sweat and shaking. I was going outside in the summer, full jacket on and still freezing. And Kristen said, you need to go to the hospital. I said, I'm sure this is just working out of my system. I'm going to be okay. Now you've got to realize when your wife is a medical doctor and she says you need to go to the hospital, she's not just saying it for fun. But I said, it'll be okay, because I'm so smart. Now, most of the wives just looked over at their husbands like, you're just like that, you dork. Amen, I heard an amen. And what is that? That's pride. Pride so often gets in the way of us doing what we're supposed to do. Guess what eventually happened at 103 degrees? I had to go to the hospital. And then I had to sit in the waiting room for six hours. And wait and wait and wait. Actually, no, six hours was the second time. Third time was only three. It's okay. I heard people talking about staying overnight. I felt like I had the, well, I didn't, at least I'll get in soon. And finally, I said, okay, I give up. Listen, listen to what it says next. Believers in humble circumstances should take pride in their high position. Time out. You know what this means? If you recognize that life isn't great, and that you're struggling in some areas, congratulations. You're ahead of the game. One of the best things we learn, by the way, if you, uh, um, I think it was uh, one of the authors used to talk about, my, you know, your kid goes to college, and then he comes home, he, and, he, and he thinks how dumb you are, and you've learned so much by the time he gets home from college. When we go to the first year of college, we all think we're the smartest people in the world. You know why? Because we're dumb. And the smarter we get, the more we go, maybe my parents did know a couple things, right? And so here's what he says. Believers in humble circumstances should take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation. 
since they'll pass away like a wildflower. Like, if you've got a lot of money, if you have a lot of supply, by the way, if you live in America, you're probably, you're, he's, not talk, he's talking about us. The poorest people in America are richer than most of the world, just so you know, if you haven't figured that out yet. And so he says, hey, even if you have your act together or think you have your act together, hey, you should rejoice that it's all temporary. Listen to what he says next. He says, it'll pass away like a wildflower, for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, especially this time of year. Its blossom falls, its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. So here's your second challenge. I will humbly ask for wisdom in my child. When's the last time you were going through something and you just found yourself complaining? Did you take any time to say, God, if you don't give me wisdom, I don't know what to do. God, I need your wisdom in this. I need your wisdom to deal with this person. I need your wisdom to deal with this area. I need your wisdom to deal with my own physical health. I need your wisdom to deal with my own mental health, right? Lord, I need your wisdom. When's the last time you started there? But what do we typically start with? I just can't believe I got to deal with this. I will humbly ask for wisdom in my trial. Listen to this quote. Nothing paralyzes our lives like our attitude that things can never change. We need to remind ourselves that God can change things. Outlook determines outcome. If we see only the problems, we'll be defeated. But if we see the possibilities in the problems, we can have victory. When you look at life, say, God, I I don't know what to do. But you can. You can. Number three, the promise. The promise. A few years ago, or last year, last summer, um, Kristen and I went out to Washington State to visit Jenna. It was 98 degrees when we left here, so we were so excited to go out and have some cooler weather. Washington State decided to have record heat. It was 103 degrees when we were there. I had to come back to Florida to cool off. But one day when we were there, we went, we went to this one mountain, and um, Jenna really wanted to go, and so we went. It, was, it, was, it wasn't even much of a hike. It really was a path paved path now granted it was uphill 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 and we got to one part and it was hot and there was a bench and i could see the top and i sat on the bench and i thought maybe i'll just tell them have a good time i'll be here when you get back i don't know if you've ever wanted to do that carl you've done that haven't you okay i just knew that and so As I sat there for just a minute, I looked up and I saw all the people. They were up on the top. They were taking pictures. And, of course, I had two ladies look at me like, you are not sitting here. Let's go. And so we went. We went to the top. We got to the top. You ready for this? There was a sheet of ice as far as you could see. There was a ram or something. I don't even remember what was up there. A ram or something running around up there. Amazing pictures. Ten degrees cooler. I won't say it was cold, but it was cooler, and it was remarkable. And I remember thinking, I'm so glad I endured and persevered and went to the top so I could see this. Listen, God has that promise for you when you persevere. Let's continue. Blessed is the one. Why don't you put your name there? Blessed is Eric. Blessed is Mike. Blessed is Carl. Blessed is Peggy. When they persevere under trial... Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life the Lord has promised to those who love him. And then we get a caution about being dragged away by our desires. Why? Because when we're going through a hard time, we look for something to take the pressure off. And sometimes what we look for is sin. And sometimes what we look for is selfishness. And sometimes what we look for is self-centeredness. And God reminds us, and James reminds us here, persevere. Keep doing what's right. But I don't feel like it. It's not about feelings. But I don't want to. It's not about want to. And sometimes all you can do is look at the top of the hill and say, okay, I know it's comfortable here. I know it's going to be hard to do what's right. But I know there's a reward from God when I do what's right. So I'm going to do what's right. You're going to have that choice a hundred times this week. And you can pray for wisdom and ask God to forgive you wisdom. Or you can fall into selfishness and self-pity and selfishness and self-centeredness and all the self-words I can throw out there. Or you can say, God, 
most spiritual thing I can do right now is just keep going. Do what you've called me to do. Finally, I want to encourage you. I will praise God for his promises. I want to encourage you this week as you're going through things, ask God to give you wisdom. Ask him to show you what to say. Maybe you're expecting a conversation with somebody this week. You're already looking forward to it. Maybe ahead of time you say, God, would you give me wisdom in knowing what to say? Hey, hey, guys, let me give you a trick too. God, give me wisdom to know when to be quiet. Sometimes the smartest thing you can do is not say anything. But God, would you give me wisdom? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that here today. I'll be here after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you're a Christian, but the truth is, hey, selfishness and self-centeredness have snuck in. It's okay. It happens to all of us. Confess it. Make it right with God. And repent. What does repent mean? Change your mind. God, I want your wisdom. I want to quit following my wisdom, the world's wisdom. I want your wisdom. And ask him to give you wisdom for the next steps in perseverance. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your spirit that fills us with your love. Lord, as we go through this life, the world tries to fill us with anger and hatred and fear. Lord, the world tries to fill us with division and frustration. But Lord, you fill us with your spirit and with your love. Give us wisdom as we walk through a world that's angry, as we walk through a world that's fearful. Lord, may we be lights in this world. May we love people like only you can. Lord, I pray for that one today who's ready to quit. Lord, just give them the strength to keep going, to keep asking, to keep knocking, to keep seeking, to follow your will today. In Jesus' name, amen.